Warning, Superpower Review is intended for a mature viewing audience. This video may show images that are not suitable for kids under 13 years old. Viewer discretion is advised. What is up, Superpower Reviewers? It's Ken Budini here, and I am super, super excited for today's show. I have a very special guest. My guest has worked on comic books such as Punisher, Batman, and he is most known for his work on Marvel Superhero Secret Wars. I would like to welcome comic book illustrator John Beatty. John, how are you doing today? Good, Ken. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm super excited for today's show, and I want to say well, thank, thank you, you uh, for coming on today. I am very honored. Oh, thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> so um, we are Skyping from uh, Florida today. Is that correct? Yes. I'm, I'm very jealous because uh, we're here in Massachusetts. There's snow on the ground. It's very cold here. I wish I was in Florida right now. <laughs> well, let's see. You know, this week we've had rain and cold. So uh, I know it's worse up there, but it's for, for Floridian, it's not too nice down here right now. No, no. So, um, John, um, I have come up with questions for you and subscribers of the channel have sent in questions for you. And... Um, are you ready for your first question? Yeah, sure. So, Let's go ahead uh, and tackle them. Th this first question is very fitting uh, because this question comes from Batcave Comics, and he is asking, what was your first experience with a comic, and what got you introduced into comic books? Uh, well, initially, um, I, I, I wasn't really into comic books. I was more into comic strips that were available in the newspaper. And the two that stand out in my mind are uh, Peanuts and Dennis the Menace. Those were, you know, those were the two that I really followed. And while I loved Dennis the Menace, I felt like I couldn't, because of Hank Ketchum's style, I, at that early age, I really couldn't grasp it. I felt like the, the Charlie Brown, the, the Peanuts strip by Charles Schultz, I, I just felt like I could draw Charlie Brown at a round head and stuff and understand it. But as I grew older, I understood his head was not quite a circle like I had imagined it, but the shape seemed easier. I, I basically kind of followed both. But when I went to do drawings, I kind of gave up on on trying to emulate Ketchum and would kind of, you know, I kind of developed to where I could draw, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a fairly good Charlie Brown, Snoopy, and Lucy, to tell the truth. So what really got you introduced is <clears throat> just more cartoons. I think it was around age 14, a neighbor up the street had a box of comics and he was selling them for 20 bucks. And I, I don't even know how I came up with the 20 bucks. Maybe I asked my mom or dad for it. And uh, it was a, a big box of superhero comics and other, you know, comic books that you'd find on the newsstand. And I bought those. And I think there was a, it was a Conan one or two in there at the time also. You know, so uh, once I got those, I, I kind of started gravitating towards the, uh, the superhero books. Yep. And, um, uh, so that kind of pivoted me, not so much into the comic strips, but then I also started going to my local neighborhood, 7-Eleven and other convenience stores and even bookstores, magazine stores, uh, that had comic books. And I would, you know, later in life when I was 15, 16, every Saturday I'd go out on my bike and hit about five stores seeing the various books that came in and trying to make my purchases and pick up the books I liked because back then you you weren't guaranteed that the next issue of what you'd read the month before uh, was going to be, you know, available. What was your first work as a comic book illustrator? Um, well, for Marvel, it was in uh, 1980. But before that... Um, I did some work for Bill Black, who had Paragon Publications, and then he also has had AC Comics. It was sequential art, comic book page size, and that was when I was uh, 17, 
uh, 17 and 18. So that was really, as far as comic books, that was the beginning. And then from there, I met Mike Zek through a fan letter. And, you know, we kind of started corresponding. And he mentored me. And uh, I also assisted Bob McLeod for a little bit of time. And he helped me out a lot. And so I had, I had some good help along the way. You and Mike are buddies, essentially. I see you guys doing cons together. And you do a lot of, uh, of his inks. Do you want to talk about your relationship with Mike Zek a little bit? Well, yeah, um, I started seeing Mike's work uh, as I, you know, was uh, on these runs to comic book shops, but I didn't see them. I think one of the first places I saw his work was in Rocket's Blast Comic Collector, which was a, a high-end fanzine back in the day. And I really, you know, I don't know, there was something that really clicked with his work. And I wound up writing a fan letter to the publisher. And little did I know that Mike lived in South Florida. And I'm up here in the Daytona Beach area. So it's, it's still a distance. But, but uh, a couple of weeks after I wrote the, the letter, Mike wrote back a real nice letter to me and sent some pencils of a Master Kung Fu issue he had penciled because I think I had sent him some ink samples. Yeah. And so he was giving me professional pencils instead of my own at the time to actually practice over. So that was just like, great. You know, here's this guy willing to, you know, maybe he saw something in my work at that young age to, you know, help, help, help me out. Right. So that was, you know, from then on, it was just like, you know, I always tell people Mike's literally the big brother I never had. Cause I'm a, I'm an, I'm, I'm a little child and an only son. So you know, I have two sisters. So Mike's my big brother. Now that's that, that's really cool because uh, I've I've got to meet Mike Zek uh, a couple of times. I got to meet you uh, once, and I, I have a fun story. So uh, the first time I got to meet you was at Mohegan Sun's Terrific Con in Connecticut. So funny story was uh, a week before there was Boston Comic Con, and this was 2018. And so mm -hmm. I never heard of Terrific Con, and until someone told me about it. So I looked up the, the guest appearances. I was like, ah, I'm not, I'm not going to go. I already spent most of my, my money on Boston. And uh, so I'm looking through the guest list, and I saw that you were on that list. And I was like, well, mm -hmm. now, now I got to go, because I have uh, two books here, which is probably the two books that you sign all the time, which is uh, Secret Wars. I have issues one and number eight here. And as, uh, as the audience can see, I don't know if you can see, but they are signed by yep. uh, Jim Shooter, Mike Zek, and yourself. So uh, you were the last signature I needed for these books. And so I was like, oh, well, it's only two hours away. I have to go and visit this man. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, thank you for coming out. Uh, yeah, um, Mitch Halleck uh, puts on Terrific On and... It's a terrific show. It's a beautiful venue, as you know, the Mohegan Suns, just a wonderful place. And uh, you were probably there then. Um, was that the, I believe that was the first year they had the, the bigger convention center? Um, I'm not sure because that was my first time there. Okay, I I've, think I've... it was. Uh, they had it a, a, a year or two before and it was a smaller venue and they were building this bigger place. And, um, you know, Mitch was able to expand his event, uh, Terrificon, into that bigger venue, which is a, a really nice place again. Uh, speaking of uh, conventions, uh, it's, a, it's a brand new year, 2020. Do you have a 2020 Comic-Con uh, events going on? Uh, yeah, I, I've done two small ones already. One was uh, actually January 4th, or no, 5th. I flew up on the 4th in Macon, Georgia. Uh, it's in the Macon area, but it's called the Warner Robins Comic Con. So I did that. It was a one-day show. And I just I, that's one that I was able to actually fly back the same day of the show. Usually I don't get that uh, because of my location. I usually have to stop in Atlanta um, due to this small airport in Daytona Beach. Um, and then I did a local one here in Deland, Florida. For a friend of mine who also does the Daytona Beach show, 
And um, that turned out to be a nice little show. Now, coming up, I have uh, the end of February, beginning of March. It's the Fayetteville, Arkansas uh, comic show. And um, then at the end of March, I have another quick one-day show in New Jersey, uh, the Jersey Super Con or Super Comic Expo. And that's going to be on March 21st. Very nice. Above, um, uh, beyond that, right now, what I can mention is uh, Orlando Megacon, which I believe is in April 14th, 15th. It's a four-day show, so it's, yeah. I think it's the second weekend of, of April this year. Nice. So, now, I have, a, um, I have another question here from a subscriber, uh, Batfan182, <clears throat> since we're talking about cons. And uh, he asks, what comic book character do you get commissioned to do the most? Um, truthfully, if, uh, if it's a show that Mike and I are both doing, and we're doing the sketch combo where Mike pencils and, and I ink, uh, it would be a toss-up between the Punisher and Captain America. Those are the two characters that, you know, we get asked to do probably 80% of the time. I was really expecting it's, a symbiote Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, occasionally, uh, that gets asked for, and when when Mike does that, he'll do, um, let me get this, um, Mike will do something like this. Um, That's so cool. Yeah, this is actually a, a friend of mine's that he's he's loaning it so I can use it uh, up on my wall here. Oh, great. So. Good friend, good friend. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, that's uh, instead of just the, because usually at shows we just do the, uh, like the head and shoulders and stuff, but with the, the, the symbiote Spider-Man, uh, Mike feels like it's such an easy thing to do. He gives like a torso and stuff. Cool. A little bit more. Now, uh, of course, a lot of the subscribers asked a lot of Secret War questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I kind of dwindled them down a little bit. Uh, but this one, this one is uh, stuck out the most. Uh, did you expect Secret Wars to be so big at the time? And um, how important is Secret Wars to comic book collectors? I think there was a certain degree of it was going to be something big but i mean that's measurable in only the fact that it was the first time something like this was gonna uh present itself into a comic book company where you have this 12 issue maxi series with virtually every character that the company is known for or Cause, that does because essentially secret wars is probably the first comic book mini series to come out on shelves well See, that's there. There was, uh, I think, Champion of Heroes that came before, and some people have mentioned that, but um, I think that was only three or four issues. So when I, that's why I say maxi series, because Secret Wars was the full year, the full twelve issues. So it was the first, like, a year big event thing from any company that involved the characters, the villains, or you know. All, almost all the characters, I can't think. There was probably some that didn't make it. Um, same with the villains. But yeah, as far as, as that, it really was special in that way. It was a toy tie-in, is, right. is the main right. thing. Right. Um, so it, as far as being big, yeah, it was kind of like expected to do well. But... He, I mean, beyond the first year it came out and maybe into the second year, I, I don't think any of us really thought that 36 or 37 years, whatever we're into now, <laughs> that it would still, you know, hold the attention of the audience that read it when they were younger, right. the audience that's now, you know, like fathers are giving it to their sons and daughters, and like, hey, you got to read Secret Wars, you know, so yeah, I mean, it... It blew up a lot bigger than any of us ever expected. Now, Secret Wars, to, to me, is so important because it, uh, it bears the first appearance of my favorite Spider-Man suit of all time, which is the symbiote Spider-Man suit, the black mm -hmm. costume. And uh, I hold that, especially issue number eight, near and dear to me because it eventually becomes 
uh, Venom, my, one of my favorite characters. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something else that you didn't expect to, uh, did, did anybody on the team of Secret Wars expect this to get so big, uh, a suit to be, become so popular? No, in fact, um, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's everywhere now, you know, it's like, it's on, uh, it's on backpacks, it's on wallets, it's on phone cases, it's, you know, not only just t-shirts like you would expect it, but, you know, that design that Mike did is everywhere now, it's on all sorts of merchandise and stuff, um, it was basically everybody that went to Secret Wars, they changed somehow. And the change for Spider-Man was, hey, he gets a new costume. You know, when Mike was doing these, you know, things that actually had to be uh, drawn, um, such as Spider-Man's costume, that was just the idea. I mean, he didn't put uh, a lot of thought into it. It was his first pass at it. And Marvel just said, great, you know, we're going with it. So they didn't nitpick it. They didn't like go and you know have to redo it five thousand times or anything or or whatever. It's just what Mike turned in, and they ran with it. And you know the story behind that really is uh, when it was time to get rid of the the suit. Just like you know, She Hulk wound up in the Fantastic Four. Now that was because of Secret Wars. And when it was time for Ben Grimm to come back off of Battle World and get back. There was no, oh, no, we, you know, we, we can't have Ben in the Fantastic Four. We want She-Hulk. But with Spider-Man, that suit, I guess, was making the company money. And they said, we have to find somehow to keep this around um, because it's making us money. It's doing well for us. And um, But as far as Shooter and Zach and myself, we never, you know, we had nothing to do with that except the initial, you know, Here's the new costume. And uh, cool. I think it was Michelini and McFarland that were doing the book. And they were tasked with, hey, you guys got to come up with something. And being an alien costume, it could attach itself to anyone. So uh, if I remember the story right, and I'm a little foggy on it, Eddie Brock was the target that they used, you know, and I guess he used it for evil. Now, um, as a comic book illustrator or an mm -hmm. inker, um, just one more question about the symbiote suit. Uh, did you have a sigh of relief not doing a bunch of webs on a costume? <laughs> how much? How much time well, did uh, that suit save you? <laughs> I don't know because um, filling in blacks can take a long time too. You know, uh, believe it or not, it's it's uh, especially in the day of, of of this day where some people will scan their pages in if they traditionally ink them and dump in blacks in Photoshop. I would have to sit there with a brush or whatever and fill the blacks in. Um, so, you know, it does take time just to fill blacks in on a page uh, to turn them in um, before that technology came about. So I'm sure it probably did speed the process up a bit. I'm just not sure how much. I swear, the whole episode is not going to be about Secret Wars, but I have uh, two more questions for you. Okay. Um, now that there is a, uh, you know, there's always a debacle in the comic book community on what is the true first appearance of a character. And, um, you know, f a lot of people say, you know, Secret Wars 8 is the first appearance or Amazing Spider-Man number 252 is the first appearance of the symbiote Spider-Man. What is your take? Who, which comic book should uh, own the title of the first appearance of the symbiote costume? Well, um, in publication, uh, history of course amazing 252 came out first right um if you want to go from a storytelling standpoint and now that it's out and been out for decades you can go read secret wars 1 to 12 straight through and you can see how spider-man got the costume before it was just i think in amazing it said something about see secret wars 8 or they had their little they had their little note thing yeah yeah had a little note and secret wars 8 had not come out yet so you know you get that scale thing right you know to me it's like i'll discuss that with fans and shows and stuff and it's always like well you know it really wasn't the first appearance and i'm like well it depends on you know which you know which one do you want to go with do you right. want to go with 
continuity or do you want to go with publication? You know, publication, it's going to win because, well, even before Amazing 252, you know, Mike had done a sketch. Rick Leonardi, uh, I think maybe he was the artist on 252 or uh, he had something to do with doing a little bit more of a pose and stuff like that. Mike did basically a turnaround. And that's what you see in Marvel Age. And some people will bring that up and, you know, they'll think that Mike didn't design the suit, that here it is in Marvel Age. No, Rick Leonardi designed it. But Rick was just doing a quick sheet for him to work off of, and they just happened to publish it in Marvel Age. So there's a lot of confusion about yeah. the suit. Yeah. Um, but I've, I can I've, tell I've you. He I've heard about the Marvel Age a lot, too, as well. And right. uh, it's it's that whole thing in the comic book community about uh, there, there's a there's always a um, a discussion about a character's true first appearance and uh, right. that that whole symbiote Spider-Man is one of them. Now I have uh, one more question for you about Secret Wars, and I promise we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna tie, okay. uh, shy away from it. Uh, <laughs> this question is really good, and I and I wanted to ask you this. Um, you know we have. The Marvel Cinematic Universe almost coming out with a new movie in theaters almost every weekend with superheroes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, do you think that the MCU will ever come out with a modernized uh, Secret Wars story interpreted into a movie? Or, and would you like to see that? Well, I, I do think they will because... Uh, it was either on Twitter or an interview. I think it was in an interview. The Russo brothers, uh, they've actually stated that the next big thing they want to do for Marvel is a Secret Wars movie. Um, so right there, you know, if they're, you know, if that's on their agenda, I think it will be done. Um, I can't, uh, you know, for me, it would... And, and I know that Marvel is slowly getting their characters back from a deal they made with, was it Fox, I think? Fox, yep. So, and, and they have a partnership with I believe with they have the FF back now. Yep. Um, uh, I don't know what just happened with Spider-Man. He came in for a movie, and now he's he's not slated for anything this but year. Now, but he, they, they, they made an agreement. He's back now. So so Marvel okay. and, uh, you know, Marvel and, and uh, Sony are playing nice with each other now. So Right. So, you know, I, yeah, I definitely think that's something uh, that's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. I would like it sooner rather than later. Uh, not that it's going to put money in my pocket. Um, I, I won't see anything from it. Now, Mike Zeck and Jim Shooter will probably, you know, get some invites and stuff. But as an inker, nah. You know, I, 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 I always say, and, you know, I've said it on my YouTube stream, when people have brought this up to me, I'm like, you know, I could go see the movie at my movie theater and Marvel is not even going to make the offer to like, hey, let, you know, we're going to buy your tickets or something. You know, what'd you, what'd you see? Here, here's a check for a couple hundred dollars. Go, go, you know, go see it or something. But I, I really think if they do it, uh, I would like to see it as a three part movie. Um, well, I, I think it's too much to try to put in one. Because there's a lot going on, and uh, I think with, you know, what they would have to cut out and, and maintain the story, it would be either it'd be a real long uh, one-part movie. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they could do it too. Possibly they could. I, could I mean, see, uh, the M I, Avengers. I could see three being two. perfect. Right. What's that? The the Avengers uh, movie with Thanos uh, was was a two-part movie, so they could probably do it in two parts. Right. And they, but they had a lot of setup beforehand with all the other movies. True. True. You know, if you what was it like a total of eighteen movies or something? Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, it's it's. So that's there. what I'm saying. If if they just do Secret Wars and don't build up to it, you know, maybe three. Uh, that's why with the Venom movie, they really can't do the true origin of Venom because of the the Spider-Man thing that that happened with Fox. So it's like I could see where they really want to do one, but also until they do Secret Wars. They really can't show the true, from comics perspective, origin of Venom. So we, we are officially done with Secret Wars questions. Okay. <laughs> um, what are some of the artists that inspired you or uh, comic book artists that you look up to? Um, I'm sure there's a list of them. 
There is. There's there's a long list. Uh, of course, you know, Mike Zek was one of the first that, you know, uh, hit my radar. And uh, um, Michael Golden, there's another Mike. Uh, Kelly Jones, who I also got to ink. I, that, those three guys I got to ink, and, and, and I just loved inking all of them. Um, some of the people before that, uh, John Buscema, um, Al Williamson, uh, Wally Wood, uh, I loved inking and look inking. I wish, uh, I love looking at Frazetta's, uh, Frazetta. old pen and ink work. Yeah. You know, I love looking at his paintings, but you know, when I would see that lush brushwork and stuff he did, it just really, you know, was amazing. Um, I know I'm going to forget people, uh, Starenko, uh, you know, Legend. I, most of the people that, you know, uh, there's even some foreign artists that I really like. Um, of course, Mobius is in there. Um, uh, there's a guy here. I have a bunch of books. Uh, Yves Chaland. He does a very clean line style. It's more cartoony and stuff, but um, just wonderful to look at and to get inspiration from. Uh, in current art, I, I do. You know, people like uh, Dan Panosian, Dave Johnson. Um, I know those guys. I, I, I love their work. Brian Stelfreeze is another one that just completely, you know, he, he does some work and it just knocks my socks off. Chris Somney is another guy who you may have heard of. Um, but yeah, so there's just, you know, a list as 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 long as I could make it, you know, that of, you know, certain people that I, I study their work and, and try to absorb as much as I can and try to somehow incorporate it into what I do. And uh, so that's the fun part, you know. Hmm. Appreciating and, other people's artwork. Yeah, and I would say the person, the most current person, and he's been around for a while, but the, the person that's out there right now putting out a book whose work I really admire is uh, Sean Gordon Murphy. Oh, nice. The white knight work. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, that and the Tokyo Ghost stuff he did and, and the other stuff. Just, uh, you know, him penciling and inking his own work and stuff. It's it's really got a nice voice to it. Now, are you reading any current comic books right now? Um, trying to think. Not not really. I mean, I, I occasionally will pick some up and... They just don't capture whatever it was, you know. It could just be because I'm older, but I still like entertainment. But um, um, I don't know. To me, it's here's my love-hate. I love technology. I'm a tech guy. Love it. Um, but to me, when I pick up a comic book, I really miss the feel of uh, the glossy, thinner cover, the newsprint inside that's kind of, you know, not pure white. I totally understand. And it's a textural thing. Yeah. And the old style printing where you don't have like the entire palette to use, you know, where it's like you have this limited amount of colors and therefore make it work. You know, it's almost right. like a challenge, but in a good way. So with the technology, uh, the good thing is a lot of stuff that I inked, especially when they went through the um, transition of metal plates to plastic plates uh, a lot of lines you, I mean you know I was just doing doing my inking and when I saw like the first issue that was uh, put on a flexograph plate a lot of the thin lines dropped out a lot of the thick lines got thicker it was horrible and it took them about maybe six months to get it right and but during that six months, once you saw that first issue and you're already a couple issues ahead, you try to correct your work so that you can overcome that. Now you can put down uh, uh, the finest line possible and a scanner, you know, a, a, a computer hooked up to a scanner is going to pick it up and you're going to get that line printed. So there's a lot less guesswork in what the finished product is going to be these days. It's very interesting. Um, you know, if I had to pick between old comics and newer comics, I'm definitely more into the older books. Um, older books is what stays in my collection more often than right. newer books. You know, some newer books I'll buy off the shelf, 
read it and you know uh i'm very picky about what stays in the in in the collection also because mm -hmm. i don't have uh, a tremendous amount of room for for comic right. books but uh you know it's rather it stays or it goes and um mm -hmm. you know I, I so i really love the the feel of an old comic book you know like you said the the old newspaper uh, yeah printed. it's a textural thing you know you pick yeah. it up and it you know it's got a certain texture to the paper and you can feel the you know, like modern comics, you open it up and the cover feels about the same as the interior. Very glossy. The cover, yeah. Yeah. It, it, the cover may be just a bit heavier, but in an old comic book, you open that thing up, you're feeling the gloss on the cover, you're feeling the newsprint on the inside. It even has, you know, newsprint may even have that certain smell, you know. Yes, it's, it does. So it does. <laughs> it really resonates. It's weird, but it really <laughs> resonates with all your senses. You know, right. Uh, sight, you know, touch, smell, uh, feel. T well, I said that. Um, I guess you can't really hear it. You know, maybe the pages sound different when you turn them. Maybe uh, that's that's one of the biggest things with with comic book collectors, especially on old books, is that old comic book smell. You just open it. And... Yeah, <laughs> that old newsprint with, you know, the hey. The, the, the best printing they could do at the time. And we would even, you know, a lot of us, we were kind of aware of how our lines were going to uh, be printed on that newsprint. You know, they, they would kind of soak into the paper more because the paper didn't let the inks lay on them as, as they do now, you know. So uh, you kind of, you know, once you saw enough of your work in print, you could kind of adapt to that. Are you, um, now that we're in this conversation, it kind of perked up another question. Um, you mm -hmm. know, with digital art, you know, being uh, one of the most used methods now, are you afraid that the old traditional style is going to eventually uh, fade away and not be used anymore? Uh, yes and no. Um, I think a lot of people do go the digital route because it's faster. Um, uh, if they need to make a change, they can just, you know, do a selection, move it around, whatever. Yep. Um, it's easier to flop your artwork back and forth to check for any drawing mistakes or anything like that. Um, however, you know, on the side of selling original art, you don't really have an original when it's all digital. Um, so a lot of people do take that into consideration. Some don't, some do. Yeah. So, but... You know, I've done uh, I've done some digital stuff, and I wholly believe that if you learn traditional first, I think the digital might be a little bit more. You can adapt to it a little bit quicker. I can agree with that. You know, I mean, that's I I don't have any proof behind that because I started traditional, but when I go to do something like a my iPad Pro or something. I thought there was going to be this huge learning curve and like after a couple hours, I'm just, you know, I'm in procreate ink in a headshot or something. And I'm just like, you know, no big deal. Easy. Yeah. I, I agree that not that I'm a, a professional artist right. or anything. I mean, I doodle around, but, uh, you know, going from, from paper to, you know, uh, to, to a screen, uh, mm -hmm. I, I can, I can definitely go with what, with, with what you're saying there. Now, um, Probably one of the last questions I'll give to you, and then you can you can tell the audience about where they can follow you and see your artwork. But the last question we have is, what advice would you give to an artist today trying to get do, uh, trying to do comic books full time? Well, uh, that's something that also I am probably not the best person to answer that because the protocol for how you broke into comics when I did was a lot different. Um, these days with the internet and everybody having access, like equal access to it pretty much, um, you can get your work out there and you can get eyes on it by, you know, thousands of people. Um, before it was very um, organic in the fact that you, you had to attend a show where there was gonna be somebody like a Jim Shooter. Mm. Luckily he, he would do the Miami show down south for me every year. And my exec lived there, and Mike was kind of already pushing me. And so that was a big help. Um, 
in the way uh, eventually, you know, Jim was seeing samples from me every year and Mike would, you know, also bring some stuff into the office. Um, but uh, I think it was in 1980, that's when uh, Jim Shooter basically looked at my newer stuff and just said, well, John, I'll tell you what. He goes, I think you're at the point where if you get up to New York, I will give you a paid tryout. And so in July of 1980, I, you know, I flew up and Mike was, you know, uh, kind enough to let me crash at his apartment at the time, took me in. We got, uh, uh, you know, I got the tryout story from Jim to Inc. I'd also been inking on more samples like the week before uh, that we went in so that Jim could even see newer stuff. And with Mike being over to be directly over me going like, nope, redo that, you know, or <laughs> do more like this, less like that, you know. So it was a, it was a good time. And uh, from that, it, you know, I got the, uh, you may have heard it before or not, and it, it it's kind of true. Jim would be like, you know, he, he bought a few things off of me. He's like, okay, now you go over to D.C. and get really good and then come back and see me then. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did. I, I, I got over to D.C. for probably about eight or nine months. Yep. And then that's when uh, the Captain America job opened up for me at Marvel. Um, now, back to the original question, though, that's kind of how, that's the short version of how I got in. Uh, it could go more in depth, but I know we don't have all the time. Um, you know, I mean, the online portfolios and getting noticed by editors, I've heard that sometimes uh, editors are following people and they don't know it mm -hmm. until they'll get an email and say, hey, I'm I'm so-and-so with this company. You know, I've been following your work for maybe up to two years because the editor wants to see, is this all the person's got or are they putting out consistent work that's also improving, right. you know, so they will check in on that person every now and again. And then eventually when they feel they're ready, they'll send them an email and then say, I've got something that I'm interested in trying you on. You know, are you, are you, are you ready to, you know, are you ready to give it a shot? And, and most so people are, you know, most people that get that offer will. And social media, you know, now is such a huge game changer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and stuff like that. People can follow and, you know, people can pretty much be, uh, you know, put up a, a soapbox and, and, and vouch for this artist as well. Um, but speaking of uh, social media, why don't you uh, take the time and tell people mm -hmm. how they can follow you, where they can see your artwork. I, I know you're on YouTube. Um, I, I found mm -hmm. I, I, I think I found you since the beginning, since you started uh, doing YouTube and I, I right. watch a lot of your live streams and I get mm -hmm. very inspired when I watch your live streams as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, YouTube channel I started uh, I think at the end of 2018 um, and I was even doing a daily uh, stream except for on the weekends for a while and then once convention season started last year that tapered off and then towards the end of the year I wasn't doing anything. I'm back to streaming uh, a bit this year. Uh, I'm trying to do probably two to three live streams of me inking something or doing art or whatever uh, per week. You can find me at just uh, YouTube. Just search my name, John Beatty, and you should be able to find my channel um, uh, on uh, Instagram, again, it's just at John Beatty. And at Twitter, it's at John Beatty Art. On Facebook, at John Beatty Art. I have a fan page there that you can follow. Uh, my website is johnbeattyart.com, which I am currently in the process of trying to uh, redo. So if you go there and it, it doesn't look like, <laughs> you know, there's not, there's not a lot up, it's because I haven't had the time to dedicate to it. Uh, same thing with Facebook. I just, like, I think it was last weekend, I just went and deleted all the old posts from back, I think I started around 2013, yeah. but I just got rid of all the old stuff, and it's ready for new content to start coming in, so eventually they will meet somewhere, and I'll, I'll have enough on each platform, but right now, 
Uh, I really enjoy the interaction on YouTube. Yes. Um, while I'm drawing or inking, I can have a conversation with the people that are in the room. They can ask questions. Most definitely. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where if I have an opportunity or if I have the time, I'm spending a, a lot more time on YouTube than anywhere right now. Uh, John, uh, I really want to thank you for your time and being on the show today and answering my questions and subscribers' questions. This has been a, a lot of fun, and I, I'm so happy that I was able to get, to get you on the show today. Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Um, uh, good luck with your channel, and I'll, I'll, I'll help you promote this as, as, as much as I can once it's up. And, uh, uh, we'll get it out there in Twitter and, and other social media and see, uh, see what it'll bring. Thank Hopefully you. it'll do good for both of us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So, guys, that's going to do it for today's video. Be sure to show your support by commenting on this video, liking the video, and subscribing to the channel. That's going to do it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.